welcome back to the Center Bros Podcast. Boys, how are you guys today? I'm doing great, Tyler. Doing just fine, Tyler. How are you? I'm doing great myself. So, what is today's episode, Luke? So, Tyler, today we are going to be debating which is better between Ari Aster's two films he's made so far, Midsommar and Hereditary. I will be defending Midsommar, and Tyler will be defending Hereditary. And Ray, of course, will be moderating the debate. Ray, would you like to take us away? So this debate will begin, like every other debate, with the opening argument. Then we'll go into round one, which will be our writing round which is usually my worst round. And then we'll go into round two, which is the directing. And then we'll go round three, acting, and then we'll close it out with the closing argument. Are you just saying the writing round is your worst round to make fun of me for losing it to you that one time? <laughs> you know, I forgot about that. What Which debate was that that you, uh, that I beat you in that? That was, that was Paul, Paul. That was Paul Bart. Paul Bart, yeah. Well, without further ado, I guess we'll hop into the debate. Luke, since you were the last champion, would you like to start? All right. So I think it's fair to say that Ari Aster is one of the best up-and-coming directors in general, uh, mainly horror, just because the two movies he's directed so far are in the horror genre. But he's an amazing filmmaker. I don't think that's up for debate. I I don't think he is the best up-and-coming horror filmmaker. I think, Tyler, you think he is the best, right? That is correct, yep. Yeah, I don't think he's just the best up and coming horror director. I think he is one of the best up and coming directors in general. OK, he is very good for sure. I'm more of a Mike Flanagan guy, but that's just personal taste thing. But Ari Aster is great. And I have really enjoyed both Midsommar and Hereditary. I, of course, am defending Midsommar. So I liked it a lot more than Hereditary, but both good films in their own right. To me, this really just boils down to the themes that each movie explores. Now, obviously, Hereditary explores the theme of family tragedy and essentially the antagonistic force of the movies causing the family to crumble, basically, and to kind of go insane. And if you look at the uh, if you look on Wikipedia on the um, synopsis or on the genre of this movie, it's listed as a horror tragedy, which is definitely true. I think that's pretty obvious and, and you could say midsummer is a tragedy in a way just not nearly as much as hereditary but i'll be honest with you i find the theme of i find it to be more enjoyable and i think it's explored a little better i like midsummer's theme of a relationship and how a relationship that's been going on for a long time can become destructive when neither person in the relationship is getting anything out of it that's like the central overarching theme of midsummer of course you know not talking about the the weird swedish cult and all kinds of stuff but i just feel like that theme was explored a little bit better in mid in uh, midsummer than the theme of family tragedy in hereditary i think the relationship theme is just it's a little bit more intriguing to me and i think it was explored a little better i think in hereditary you know these movies are similar in structure in the sense that you know crap kind of hits starts to hit the fan progressively through the movie. And I think most horror films do that. But in this movie in, in midsummer, I just, I feel like it was honestly done better. Uh, there's not a whole lot I can say because I do enjoy both films, but overall, I just think midsummer presents a more interesting take on a tragedy of sorts, albeit in a different way. Um, I really love the setting of this movie. Holy cow. I love that. the I love the fact that this movie is, you know, set, entirely during daylight except for the opening 15 minutes which i'll definitely get into later but i love the i love that setting for this movie you know obviously horror movies especially supernatural horror movies and hereditary is no exception most of the horrific moments take place at night and you know what i mean there's no problem with horrific scenes taking place at night but i just love the contrast between the bright summer setting versus the absolutely horrific things that are taking place on screen. I don't think a lot of horror movies have explored that and I've really enjoyed that. So, and I love the acting in both movies. Midsummer, I think Florence Pugh is, and I've said before in our first episode where we talked about her top 10 favorite movies, that Florence Pugh's performance in this movie is my favorite performance by an actress than anything. I think she's fantastic. I I enjoy both movies, like I've said, but I just think Midsummer is just a tad better. 
And that's really all I have to say for my opening argument. Okay, Tyler, do you like to take it away with yours? I would, yes. Luke, you focused a lot on themes of the movies in your opening argument, so I will do the same. You mentioned that on Wikipedia, Hereditary is listed as a horror tragedy. And I think we will both agree, having watched it, that that is definitely true. Yep. And I just did some quick research right now on the show. Uh, Midsummer is listed as a folk horror movie, which yep. I think we would both agree is accurate as well. But the, why I prefer Hereditary more than Midsommar is I think Hereditary is perfect in every single way. I think wow. Hereditary, I don't know if I have ever watched a movie like Hereditary that so perfectly nails every single thing it says to do. It nails the acting. It nails the writing. It nails the directing. And it sticks so closely to the theme of horror like or like the genre of horror tragedy and like the theme of like family, like the sins of our father type family drama that it is a masterclass in like nailing your messaging and knowing exactly what you want to say and how you want to get that on screen. Midsommar is a great movie. And like Luke, I also love both movies. I think both are great movies. But what to me, what distinguishes Hereditary more than Midsommar is that Midsommar feels like a movie that is trying to do different things all in one. And you can argue that it does all those things really well. Like it, uh, Midsommar even has like comedic elements that Hereditary doesn't have. And like, I'll admit, like Midsommar is pretty funny um, at certain points. And, you know, it does like the folk horror. It does like the breakup movie, like the kind of like a revenge movie in a way if you look at a central theme of Danny trying to get back at Christian for like how he's treated her throughout the entire relationship but the distinction between Midsommar and Hereditary to me is Hereditary mainly sticks to that one central theme of this family just collapsing in on itself because of the actions of the matriarch of the family the the grandmother who's died and all of her relatives having to deal with the problems that she's caused. Like it nails everything related to that so perfectly. And because of that, you're you're able to well and truly understand the message of the movie. Like and it, it's not like it like beats you over the head with it. Like it's just you're sitting there watching it unfold in a masterful way. And like, that's really that's really my opening argument. Like to me, the difference between Hereditary and Midsommar is Midsommar is a movie that tries to do a lot of things and it does do those things well. But Hereditary takes the time and Ari Aster has the ability to truly nail what he's going for in Hereditary. And I think Hereditary is a masterpiece of horror. It's on my top 10 list of all time. I think it may be the best horror movie ever made. I wouldn't even call Midsommar really a horror movie. Like, I didn't find Midsommar really scary at all. Meanwhile, Hereditary terrified me for months after watching it. And I say that as someone that loves horror and Hereditary was the first movie to ever truly scare me in that way. Uh, so I think that's it for my opening argument. I'll expand more of my thoughts later. All right, boys. Good rounds from the both of you. Uh, Luke, do you have anything further to add before we move on? No, I think I'm good. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and jump into round one. Writing. Tyler, since Luke started last round, I know you just got done talking, but you got to you gotta go in for some more. Sure, and I'll be glad to do so. Like I, I like I literally just mentioned, I think Hereditary is a masterpiece in every single way. I think every single portion is done to an absolute like genius level, like level, like genius level. And that that includes the writing. I don't know if I've ever watched a movie, especially a horror movie, that the writing is so perfect. Like each scene will ties perfectly into the next. Like I, I was never bored throughout Hereditary, I was always engaged with what was happening on the screen. And I felt that every scene was there for a reason. Like, I wouldn't cut out any scene from the movie. 
Uh, I think they were all perfect, and I thought that the pacing was fantastic. In terms of the writing itself, you know, we've all seen, like, a family drama movie, but I've never seen one do a, like, heredity. Like, it, it takes a simple theme and executes it so well. The writing for all the characters is so fantastic. So, for anyone that hasn't seen the movie, the, the plot of Hereditary focuses on this family of four, after the matriarch of the family, the mother of Tony Collette's character, who's fantastic in this movie, has passed away and is showing her family dealing with this. Has Tony Collette's character who plays her name's Anne, right, Luke? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I can't remember what the husband's name is, but it has Peter and Charlie as the kids played by Alex Wolf and Millie Shapiro respectively. And they're fantastic. They're phenomenal, but I'll get to that in the acting round. Um, their writing is so believable. It does not feel like the words that they're speaking are coming from actors. It feels like I'm watching just w real people that are being filmed. Ari Aster, who wrote this movie as well as directed it, did such a good job of writing realistic dialogue. It may be the best example of realistic dialogue I've ever seen. And the thing I love about it is like, you know, Unlike most horror movies, you can kind of understand why the family is unraveling as it is. Like, uh, you know, at the start, we start where, like, it's pretty obvious from the get-go that this is not a perfect family. This family has, like, deep-rooted emotional issues that we find out later in the film. So I'll, I'll you know, this we do spoilers on this show, so I'll get into it. So, like, Annie, who... Her entire life has felt burdened by her mother, felt like she wasn't good enough, felt like her mother wanted to, like, felt like she was never good enough for her mother. And she was very overbearing. So when Annie started having kids and her mom really, really wanted to, like, have a relationship with her kids, she she kept Peter away from her because she was kind of, like, afraid of her in a way. But she said that since she let Peter, since she let Peter, like, grow up on his own, she would give Charlie the, the young girl to her grandmother or to her mom. And we see that Charlie very obviously has some sort of mental disorder. So Charlie is not acting on her own capacity. In the, and Annie, because of all this trauma that grew up in her childhood, we see that reflected in her children. And there's a scene in the movie where Annie is talking to, I want to say it's the, uh, the cult woman. And she's explaining why she doesn't have the best relationship with her kids. And she tells the story of how she sleepwalks. And one day she wakes up and she's standing over Peter's bed and she has doused him in gasoline and she's holding a match. So that explains like all the kind of tension between her and the kids at the start of the movie before we know anything about them. And that storyline is revealed with such a grace as the writing progresses, like more and more events happen and her and Peter's especially relationship becomes more and more strained when the big reveal happens as to why it's that strained to begin with, you understand what's been happening this entire time. Like you understand like, oh, that's serious. You know, initially you think Peter is just like an angsty teen, but then you realize like, oh, this family is actually really, really broken. There are some serious fundamental issues here. And those issues are laid out so beautifully in the film. Like I said, Charlie is mentally disabled. And you can see that Annie really doesn't have the, her own mental capacity to, to deal with that, to know how to, to raise that type of daughter. And... You know, the husband who, by all accounts, acts as the audience character in a way in this movie. Like, he's the only character that really doesn't have, like, that many, like, personal issues going on. Like, you could argue that most of the problems that the dad experiences in this movie come from, like, just his family collapsing around him and him feeling inadequate. Like, he can't do anything about it. Um, so, like, all that is there at the beginning of the movie. And, you know, for the first little bit, we're just like becoming more acquainted with these characters and like the many problems that they've grown up with. And the movie really starts kicking into gear when Peter wants to go to a party 
with some of his friends and Annie forces him to take his sister with him. Well, his sister is deathly allergic to peanuts and they get to the party and, you know, of course, he doesn't want his sister like, you know, mingling with him at a teenage party and you know, smoking weed, drinking alcohol, whatever. So he says, just just go get some cake, Charlie, just go get some cake. Well, it turns out there are peanuts in the cake and she begins to have a severe allergic reaction. And she doesn't have her medication with her, so Peter has to go and rush her to the hospital. And on his way, Charlie opens the window to get some air and unfortunately collides with a telephone pole and is decapitated. And I'll get more into this scene in like the directing and acting stages, but Peter's reaction is one of the most viscerally real things I've ever seen put to screen. And the writing for the next like five minutes after that is haunting, absolutely haunting. So Peter returns home and just goes to bed because he's in shock, leaving Annie to discover the body in the morning. And Tony Collette's breakdown is written in such a realistic way that you feel like you're watching someone on the screen who has actually lost their daughter in real life. And after that, you know, all hell breaks loose, basically. And the family just begins absolutely collapsing on itself and there was a point in the movie like a few months after that where annie is she's just gotten home from the grocery store and she meets this woman that was friends with her grandmother that i had to pause the movie and reorient myself like i have never had a movie that affected me in such a way like purely from like a, a writing perspective i had to stop the movie and remind myself that i was still a real person and that the world around me was like still real and I hadn't been drawn into the world of the movie. I have never, ever, ever had a movie do that to me. It made me like so immersed into the world. Like the story of this movie is so engaging that I literally forgot I was a real person. I think that that is a perfect point to end this argument on because I don't know how you can top a movie drawing you so closely into its world that you forget you're a real person. The writing in this movie is phenomenal. The pacing is phenomenal. The characters are written in such a realistic way. And I'm, I'll let Luke talk on his point now and we may like spar on movies. I'm, I'm curious, Luke, how you're going to defend the writing of Midsommar more than Hereditary. So yeah, so... You know, Tyler, it's it's funny when we debate movies that, you know, which is better between two movies that we both like. Um, that obviously makes it a little bit more of a of a challenge. And I agree with essentially most of what you said. It didn't have hereditary didn't have the effect on me that it had on you. I don't think I, I just found it to be a very well made and well, very well written supernatural horror movie. I obviously didn't enjoy it as much as you did. I think Midsummer hit me at a point where, you know, I just started to really get into horror and I've obviously seen all kinds of horror movies. I'm a big slasher movie fan. And I think this movie was so deep for everything that, you know, all kind nowadays I and mean, hereditary is another good example of this, that horror, most horror movies nowadays are not very deep. The characters are not very well written. You don't care about much of anything that is happening at all on screen. You're just looking for a body count of some sort or a cheap jump scare. And one of the reasons that I think Ari Aster made such a big splash with Hereditary is like you said, that it, he also wrote the movie. And I think that helped it a lot because not only is he a good director, but he put a very distinct writing style and very complex writing in Hereditary. And I think that he kind of amplifies everything great that he did in Hereditary in Midsummer. He took essentially it's another tragedy, right? It focused, the main character of this movie is Danny and she is a college student. And the first 15 minutes of this movie focuses on a absolutely awful tragedy. If anybody listening has experienced anything like this, I can't even imagine it's terrible. So, and like you, like Tyler said, we get into spoilers on this show. So Danny is the film starts with Danny having a chat conversation with her sister. And you can definitely tell even just from her sister's responses on the computer screen that she's not in a very good headspace. She obviously has some mental you know, disabilities. And Danny is very concerned because she's saying a lot of things <laughs> that are scaring her for good reason. Right. And she's very concerned about it. So Danny 
is not getting responses from her sister anymore. So in a panic, she calls Christian, her boyfriend. And I love how right off the bat, and it's just a couple sentences in this phone conversation between her and Christian, that it perfectly shows that even before this horrible event, which kicks off essentially the emotional conflict for the rest of the movie, you can see that their relationship even before this point was not very good. Danny obviously wants a relationship and you can tell where she wants someone to care, obviously, which I feel like we can all, you know, kind of, you know, feel sympathy for her in that sense, because she wants a boyfriend and she wants a significant other who seems like he cares about her problems, right? Christian is obviously someone and he's obviously established as someone who wanted a girlfriend and basically wanted a girlfriend to have a girlfriend, right? We all know people like that. Someone who just wants to be dating somebody, wants to be in a relationship, but is very emotionally distant. And Danny is pouring her heart out to Christian and basically saying, I'm very concerned about my sister. She's not answering. And Christian is essentially, you know, he acts like he doesn't care. And he basically just tells her to, you know what, just she's probably fine. Don't worry about it. You worry too much. It's also hard because Danny realizes exactly what he's doing. She realizes that he doesn't care, but it's almost like she is afraid to confront that in that moment. And it's like, they're both stuck in this weird limbo in their relationship where they both know that there's a problem, but they've been dating for so long that neither one of them wants to address it. Right. And just from that small, I mean, it's like four or five sentences on that phone conversation between them at the beginning of this movie. You already know exactly what their relationship is like. I think it's very commendable from Ari Aster's writing that he can establish that relationship so quick, like in just a couple of lines. But getting back to after that phone conversation, almost immediately after it cuts to this and there's no it's just music in this scene and it cuts to, you know, Danny's house and her sister has unfortunately killed her parents and killed herself through um, carbon monoxide poisoning from the exhaust on their car. She brings like a hose into the house and attaches it to the exhaust port and kills her parents and herself. I can't even imagine that. That's a horrible situation. And it obviously cuts to Christian trying to console Danny and Danny is understandably crying, bawling her eyes out. And Christian, even in that scene, just kind of looks like he's just distant. Like he just he he's consoling her, not because he wants to, just because he feels like since he's her boyfriend, he's obligated to. This is a relationship of obligation, not a relationship of love. And you can tell that very well. This relationship is so complex and I've never, just like Tyler said that, you know, there's been a lot of movies about family dynamics and family tragedies. And there's also been all kinds of movies about romances. I mean, probably even more so, but I feel like this relationship is so unique for a relationship that we see in film. There's no cliches here. I mean, this is the emotional centerpiece of the movie. And I just think it's so well done. This is one of my, I want to say favorite movie relationships ever, just because and not because it's a good relationship, you know, for the characters, it's obviously very destructive for both of them, but it's just very well written and very complex. And you feel like, you know, people just like this, or, you know, I mean, maybe for some of our listeners, you've been in situations kind of like this, you know, maybe not this extreme, but you know, it's obviously can be a relatable situation to be in. So after this beginning scene, which I think is just so well written, the atmosphere, the music, everything, I'll get more into that later particularly in the acting round, but this opening scene is just so amazing. It's honestly the best opening of a film. You can call it a cold open, which isn't a pun because it takes place in winter. The opening does, but I didn't mean it to kind of, I didn't mean for that pun to puns I've ever heard in my entire life. Yeah, I know it it just kind of happened, but I I had to do it. So, um, did you though? Did you? (laughs) uh, But, um, but yeah, so this 15 minutes and I, you know, Tyler's told me before that he agrees with me is amazing. And I think Tyler would say, Tyler, would you say the fit opening 15 minutes is the best part of the movie? Okay. Yeah, okay. This may, See, I, th- 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 this may count against me, but the, the opening 15 minutes of Midsommar are the best opening 15 minutes I have ever seen in a movie in period, like in general. However, I, I, I will say, and we'll get to this more in the acting round. I think that Tony Collette discovering Charlie's body in Hereditary is a much better breakdown than Florence Pugh's. Hmm. See, I, I mean, we can talk about that more in the acting round. I definitely disagree, but we'll get into that. But like Tyler said, I also think it's the best opening to a movie, opening 15 minutes of a movie ever. And I don't think that that momentum ever stops throughout the movie. And I know a lot, I've heard a lot of people disagree with me on that. A lot of people feel like this movie meanders in pace, but I don't think so. You know, it's a very long movie. It's a lot longer than Hereditary. 
I mean, it's pushing three hours. And for a lot of people, you'd think a lot of people might think, man, that's very self-indulgent and very pretentious that he would drag it out for that long. But I don't think so because it's written so well and you care about the central relationship in the movie that when maybe not a lot is happening of substance on screen, you're still invested. It's the, it's like the Quentin Tarantino effect, except he's more dialogue heavy in nature, but you know, he can take scenes and Ari Aster does this too, where there's not technically a lot of things of plot importance happening and it keeps you invested. And that's throughout the movie. I don't feel per, I personally don't feel like this movie ever drags despite it being almost three hours. And I can think of very few movies that are this length. I really you know, disagree right. with that actually. Yeah. See, I figure, I figured you would. I, th- I, um, I like Midsommar, I, but I, it, it may be about an hour too long. Really? You think so? I really do. A lot of the middle of the movie just really, really dragged, which is another reason I, I like Hereditary much more because I did like I thought the pacing in Hereditary was absolutely perfect, whereas I felt the pacing in Midsommar left a lot to be desired. Okay. Okay. Well, I agree to disagree, I guess. I think that this movie is paced, you know, very well. I, I definitely can see where you're coming from, and I've heard that a lot, you know, in, from reviews of other people who love this movie. You know, I've definitely heard that that's a weak spot in the, of the movie, in their opinion. I don't I definitely don't think so. Uh, my interest was never lost. I actually enjoyed the fact that we kind of meandered some because, you know, there's this feeling of uneasiness and dread, no, not outright horror. And Tyler also touched on this, you know, with Midsummer, And I agree with them. I think that, you know what, you couldn't if you wanted to classify this as a horror, you can. And I think most people do. But there, in a lot of ways, it doesn't feel like a straight horror movie. And to me, it, it's more, it, it keeps you uneasy. There's like a pit in your stomach the whole time you're watching it of this feeling where you're very nervous the entire time, not really scared, just you're very uneasy. And that's obviously the point of the movie. And I, I love how it maintains that feeling throughout this in, almost three hour long movie. I think that's one of the biggest strengths of the movie. But getting away from the opening scene and all that stuff. So basically, and if you've seen this movie, you know, but we're going to talk about spoilers and a little bit of a plot breakdown. Several, a lot of, you know, I don't remember exactly how much time passes, but a lot of time passes after that event. Danny, they allowed her to take some time off of school to obviously deal with this trauma and stuff. And they're going to let her retry um, later in the school year. But for their thieves, for uh, one of Christian's friends, thesis, one of their other friends, Pele, who's from Sweden and it serves as the antagonist of the movie. Essentially he convinces one of their friends who is writing his thesis on Swedish cults to come to his village where they have the, or not cults maybe, but Swedish ceremonies and customs and stuff like that, you know, ceremonies. And he convinces that friend to, Hey, come back to Sweden with me for a while for this festival that we're throwing. And, you know, they all agree to go Christian, of course, being the emotionally distant boyfriend that he is, you know, feels that Danny shouldn't know about this, even though he's going to be gone for a while. And he doesn't tell her. So she finds out um, at a party. And I love absolutely love this scene. There's a car. There's a brief car ride scene of the car ride home from the party with them. Neither one of them are talking or looking at each other. It's so awkward. And the awkwardness in this movie is another thing I love. Um, Obviously, this would be an awkward situation for both of them, right? Christian being busted for not telling Danny and Danny kind of growing in her distrust of Christian because not only is he emotionally distant, but he doesn't tell her things. You know, he keeps her at an arm's length. And this is obviously going to affect their relationship. So, you know, feeling bad, he basically invites her to go. And she decides to go with him. So they go to Sweden and most of the movie is them interacting with this cult. And, you know, you learn that they're a cult throughout the movie and experiencing just absolutely bizarre weirdness that's going on. And that's essentially what most of this movie is to some that might sound boring to just kind of explore, you know, Sweden and beautiful landscapes, by the way, but to just kind of learn a little bit more about this cult and grow in your uneasy feeling. I I absolutely love that. You know, it kept me engaged the entire time. So that is a lot of the plot is them over in Sweden and their relationship continuing to get worse. Christian at one point, you know, forgets her birthday. And obviously Pele is attempting a little bit of a, you know, Mr. Still Yo Girl thing throughout the whole movie. He seems to be the only person in the friend group, including Christian, who shows any interest in Danny. 
And for a while, you're like, well, Pele seems like a great guy. Now, you obviously learn that, oh, he's actually the antagonist of the movie, bringing his friends out here and knowing that most, if not all of them, would probably be killed. <laughs> he's not a very good guy, and he's obviously set on essentially stealing Danny away from Christian, but Pele remembers her birthday and um, draws a picture of her. And she's obviously touched by this and she's, you know, Christian tries to make it up for her and act like he didn't forget her birthday. She of course sees right through this, but again, they don't want to confront this head on. You know, they both know there's an issue and they just, they're not very good at talking about their feelings with each other. And it's a young relationship. So I could see how, you know, a lot of couples in that situation probably wouldn't be that good at talking with each other. But if you just ignore these issues, well, anybody will well, tell you wait, that. Uh, what, the, it's, it's actually, they've been dating for like four years, I think. Because if you remember, that's a plot point in the movie. When Christian well, yeah, can't remember yeah. how long they've been dating. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was about to talk about that. Okay. Yeah. So like Tyler said, uh, there's another part in the movie where he doesn't remember how long they've been dating. That, of course, is very awkward. And, you know, at this point, you've come to expect that Christian really doesn't care anymore. And Danny, it's so frustrating to watch, but, it, you know, we can we know so many people who are like this in relationships where and maybe we've been in relationships like this when there's a problem, but you don't want to confront it head on because confrontation isn't fun for anybody. But if you don't lay your emotions out on the table every once in a while, they get pent up and it ends in disaster. And just like the relationship ends in disaster, I think that's represent, um, represented in the um, overarching plot of the movie with the cult. You know what I mean? Things just kind of build up and build up until the end, which just comes crashing together and is very destructive for everybody. Obviously, Danny, throughout the movie, he is learning more about this cult and is the more distant she goes from Christian, you can kind of tell it and it is subtle, but she's growing to, you know, grow as a character a little bit, despite Christian treating her very poorly. And that just kind of continues on throughout the movie. This movie kind of, it's different from other movies where, you know, there's different points in their character arc. It's like this movie kind of starts the characters off at a point and it sets them off on a track. Like, you know, exactly where they're going and it's a matter of watching them get to that point and watching things get worse and worse. And I love how that was explored. Um, I, I know we talk about spoilers. I really don't want to get into the finale of this movie much just because I really think you should see it for yourself. It is a spectacle to behold. That's for sure. But I'll just say that everything comes to a very disturbing and chaotic head at the end of this movie the last shot of this movie which is danny staring and i'll go ahead and i'll talk about this danny staring into the camera and you know at first she looks horrified and then she slowly grows a smile on her face and it you know it's ambiguous as to really what this means you know there's different interpretations of this obviously and i think ari Aster left it up to interpretation but to end on that note after everything we've seen to kind of see danny embrace this cult and her status within the cult as you know things kind of progress through the movie is just awesome i love the relationship in this movie i think the writing's fantastic the writing's good in both movies i just feel like midsummer is a little bit better than hereditary on a writing span point tyler unless you have anything else to say i don't have much else to say about it i uh, know i'm good man okay all right so that wraps up round one um i believe luke started that round so uh, round I started two. that we'll, round actually. Tyler started that round, so we'll we'll have Luke start in round two. Okay, so with the directing in this movie, obviously Ari Aster is very talented. Me and Tyler have both talked about being admirers of his, and you know that continues in Midsummer. Hereditary is obviously a very impressive debut. He's very very good at helming scenes and setting up shots, and he's even I, Midsummer I think benefits from having beautiful scenery and having amazing cinematography, but I just feel like essentially Ari Aster's shots, just like how I talked about in other movies before on some of my movie reviews, um, the camera work in this movie is almost its own character in a way, similar to the lodge, which I recently reviewed if you want to go check that out. But the camera work in this movie essentially is so important to the plot of this movie. And I know that sounds kind of weird to some, there are so many, I just want to kind of start off by saying that there's so many shots in this movie where I've seen these shots done before, 
but the way Ari Aster does it is very impressive. There's a shot, and it's my favorite shot of the entire movie, where, spoiler alert again, there is a scene where two of the oldest people in this cult, and it happens to be a man and a woman, once they reach a certain age, they basically you know, are chosen to die, right, as a sacrifice to this deity that they're worshiping. And so they're on top of a cliff, and you don't really know what's going to happen. You, you assume because they're on top of a cliff that they're going to fall off, but they throw themselves off a cliff, right? And the woman dies very swiftly, and this shot absolutely blew me away. It, it's really, really horrifying, and I think because it's so brief, I mean, it's almost a blink-and-you-miss-it type thing, that it just hits you even harder because it kind of tests the audience's attention, you know, if they're really paying attention or not, because it hits you in the gut. Now, and it's now, really when it's really when you realize that stuff's getting serious. Yeah, Tyler, go ahead. Now, Luke, do you really think that that scene is better than the Charlie death scene in uh, Hereditary? Are you talking about like the still shot of Charlie's head? Is that what you're talking about? Yes, I am. Okay, um, I, I think so. Yeah, really, because we're I'm neutral in this, and I think both scenes are like almost equal. Like it's really close. Yeah, I, I think so too, Ray. I think it's really close. I do think the Midsummer one hit me a little bit more and it's just because it's brief. And I know that sounds kind of weird, you know, cause it doesn't focus on it very much. I mean, it's, it's really like less than a second of a, you know, the shot doesn't last long. Uh, the Charlie scene in hereditary, you know, with her head it is very, very disturbing. It's one of the best shots in that movie, but the camera kind of lingers on it for a little too long. You, you probably disagree with me. I, I like the fact that, the midsummer scene is like a blink and you miss it type thing. So when the old woman jumps off the cliff, her head smacks into a rock and you know, it shows the impact and the scene and the shot I'm talking about is for a brief second after her head smacks the rock, the impact of that pushes her head back and you can essentially just see her face totally caved in and skin flying back. And I mean, it's absolutely disgusting. When I watched this for the first time, with one of my friends, he almost walked out <laughs> because he was just, and I've, it's funny because he lasted through that scene, but the movie gets way more horrific near the end. But I, I mean, it's crazy and it, it's just for a second, but I mean, it leaves you speechless. It, I, I had no words, hardly the very quick and the special effects are amazing. By the way, Pract all these effects in both these movies were practical, right? We're, there wasn't any CGI in, in a uh, hereditary was there maybe a little, but not much. Right, Tyler? Can you confirm? Not much that? at all. Not much at all. Yeah, I didn't I didn't think so. Yeah, both of the effects in both of these movies are really well done. Um, but the gore effects on, I mean, it's just a brief second of a shot, but I had to talk about it because it impacts me more than any shot in either of these movies. So that shot was amazing. Again, both these movies are shot incredibly well. It's like, to me, and this is the theme of this entire debate, not just his directing, but his writing overall, but especially the directing, in my opinion, I feel like he takes everything amazing that he did in Hereditary and just amplifies it in Midsummer. So I think the directing in this movie is just absolutely fantastic. And that's really all I have to say about the directing. All right. Good round, Luke. Tyler, go ahead. Sure. Luke, you uh, you spent a lot of that round talking again about more how, like, the things you liked in Midsommar and talking about, you know, some of Ari Aster. But I, I really want to focus more on what I think makes Ari Aster such a good director. I, I want to talk about some of the things that he did in Hereditary that blew me away. Blew me away. Hereditary was filmed on a soundstage. It's very different than Midsommar was filmed, you know, out in the Swedish countryside. I don't know if they actually filmed it in Sweden, but they filmed it somewhere outside. Hereditary was filmed on a soundstage. They built the house like they didn't film in a house they built the house they like every room in the house was like laid out perfectly and if anyone knows anything about like horror film history it's pretty common knowledge that stanley kubrick built the sets of the shining in such a way to confuse the audience well ari aster does kind of the same thing in hereditary he built rooms of the house so much bigger than they would normally be in like a normal house just so he could fit the camera at the back of it and make you feel like this entire scene is like has like a surreal quality to it 
where like there are times he uses it to like make you feel claustrophobic in the scene and like his playing with space and like taking the like the time to actually lay that out and like lay out his shots like where he wants the camera like where it's gonna be most effective to scare the audience and all that stuff shows like such a level of like care into his craft that most directors nowadays don't have and another thing it's like his blocking in hereditary is phenomenal like absolutely phenomenal there there was a scene and the first time i saw it i almost jumped out of my skin because it scared me so much it's it's right near the end of the movie after the dad has died and annie has had her complete mental break and had been taken over by the demon payment she like crawls on the wall in the ceiling and there's a scene where peter has a nightmare and he wakes up and it looks like he's alone in the room but if you notice annie is on the ceiling above him in the corner of the room just barely visible if you're not paying attention you will miss her but i i just my eyes came to that corner and i saw her and i jumped so much i was terrified immediately and that's something that Hereditary does well. In almost every single scene of Hereditary, there is a cultist watching the family. And it really sells the whole, like, everything that's happening is out of this family's control. There, there are forces that are much bigger than this family, like, guiding this all along. And, Luke, as I'm sure you might mention in, like, contrast to this, yes, he does do the same thing in Midsommar, but not nearly as much. What he does in Midsommar is much more like symbolism and like place little things that like yeah. tells what's going to happen in the story. In Hereditary, it's designed to scare you if you notice it. Like it's not designed to like tell you anything about the story. Hereditary is more of like a pure horror movie in that Everything that you see on the screen is designed to get under your skin. And his directing ability to, like I said, to block, to know where to place people, to know where he wants that camera shows his mastery of directing. And another thing, like kind of kind of in the same vein as blocking, but like I don't know how he does it. But in every movie, his direct, his relationship with actors are phenomenal like i think you'll agree luke like whatever he does to like his female leads he breaks them emotionally like if they give just that they dwell into like the deepest essence of their soul to like give such heart-wrenching performances yeah and that, like i said i i think tony collette's character is way way better of a character than florence pugh's character and like all that in hereditary but like all the actors in hereditary are so good like millie shapiro this is like one of her first film movies and she absolutely kills it as charlie and like alex wolf kills it as peter and like you'd argue that that's good like casting but like for him to raise these normal actors like what he actually does as a director that makes him so special and why in hereditary it's just on a whole different level than Midsommar. That's all I got to say, really. Okay. All right. That'll wrap up round two of the directing. We'll now go into the third round, acting. And Tyler, go ahead and start us off. All right. So this is this is the part I've been most excited about because like, I'm finally talking about Toni Collette. You know, Toni Collette is a veteran actress. She's been around for decades. In my opinion, Hereditary might be her best performance ever given. It, it it will go down as like her magnum opus of acting, and it's a crime that she did not win Best Actress or was even nominated for it at the Oscars. This is unironically one of the best female performances I have ever seen. Like the scene where she discovers Charlie's body will pierce your heart, and you won't forget it easily. Her wails, it feels like she has lost her own daughter, and from that point on. You can see it in her face. You can see it in her mannerism. She is a broken person. And I have never seen anyone portray 
just such sullen grief so much than her. And I will say the same for Alex Wolf. Immediately after the accident happens, and this kind of ties into directing, uh, and it ties into Ari Aster knowing exactly what to show and what not to show. You don't cut to see what happened immediately. You linger on Alex Wolf's face for a good minute or two as he drives home and there's no dialogue. He says nothing. The amount of emotion that Alex Wolf is able to portray just in his facial expression shows a level of talent in acting that we don't see very often, especially as someone kind of as young as him. And speaking of people that are young, Millie Shapiro, I've said multiple times, she knocks it out of the park. She is not in this movie nearly as much as the trailers and stuff will like have you think. But when she's on the screen, she kills it. And honestly, she, for as little screen time as on the screen, she is like a horror icon now. Everyone knows who she is. And like everyone universally agrees that her acting performance was great. Like she plays someone that, you know, has like a mental disorder. That's not an easy role to play. And she does it in a way that it doesn't feel like an actor. It feels like you're watching someone. She's very subdued. She doesn't like her clicks that she does. Like they aren't played up for anything. Like I said, she is very subdued. She is very respectful for like the type of character she is playing. And even the dad, the dad who of, of the four family members is the most minor to the story. He plays his part fantastically. I mentioned this in the writing round. He's kind of like the audience character, just kind of like all this crazy stuff happening around him. And he reacts in such a realistic way and that it never feels forced. It never feels like you're watching a horror movie character that like doesn't know how to deal with it. Like he genuinely tries his best to like deal with all this. And like the actor that portrays him, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with his name, but he's so good and kind of Alex Wolf, like, you know, his emotions and his mannerisms, everything as the movie progresses and it goes more and more insane, just like blows you away at how well he's able to portray this like crashing world around him. Um, it's phenomenal. And like, I think all of the main characters in Hereditary outclass the, their Midsommar counterparts. And Luke, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Right. So, and Tyler, you know, we've obviously both praised each of these movies a lot throughout this review or throughout this um, debate. And in my opinion, I think that the acting in both of these movies is the best part. Now, obviously, Tyler might disagree with me on that, but especially in Midsummer, Florence Pugh's performance absolutely elevates this movie. She is on an entirely different level than almost any other actor's that I've ever seen sure, certainly more than the other actors in this movie who do a very good job with the parts that they were given. And just like how we've talked about Tony Collette being fantastic, Florence Pugh doesn't get as enough recognition, you know, I, even though neither of them were nominated for best actors, which I think we both agree is a crime. That's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. They both deserve, they both deserve nominations. Can I just, uh, what were you going to say? Can I just add one little comment real quick? I okay. think, I think you just mentioned something. That, that goes to show why I think Hereditary is better. You know, you said Florence Pugh carries the whole thing. In Hereditary, they're all equally as good. Like, Tony Collette probably gives the best performance out of all of them, but all the actors do a fantastic job. Well, right. And they all do a good job in Midsummer. The fa it just focuses on less people. You know, there's you got your two characters. It really, it mainly focuses on Danny. And the actor who plays Christian Jack Rayner is the guy's name, Irish, an Irishman. And he's really good as well. Um, when I said she carries the movie, it's weird. It's like if you cast anybody else in that role, it wouldn't have been as good, but it would have been pretty close. I think she just really elevates the movie. And I think at the same time, I think Tony Collette outclasses all of her co-stars, too. I think she's better than Alex Wolf is. Alex Wolf's really good, but see, I'll, I'll just disagree. like in this movie, I think she's I think she's on a different Tony Collette's on a different level. And I think Florence Pugh, even more so. She's absolutely fantastic as someone who is British. It's one of the most convincing accent American accents in a movie I've ever seen. You know, as someone who, you know, one of my main drawing points in the movie is, is the acting believable, right? Do I believe that these actors are who they are portraying? You know, when I look at good acting, I want 
them to be kind of engulfed by the character they're playing. You know, a lot of times some of my favorite acting performances are people who were unrecognizable to me in a movie. Like they're so much and not from a physical perspective, but they're just so much their character that I forget really who Florence Pugh is when I'm watching this movie. And she's just Danny to me. You know what I mean? I kind of forget about the actress playing her in a way because it's so believable. The grief that she shows and Tyler mentioned Tony Collette's grief when she finds Charlie's body. And I just disagree that that's more powerful than Florence Pugh's performance. Whenever, you know, at the beginning of the movie, when she's sobbing on the couch and Christian's trying to console her, it's the most real crying in a movie I've ever seen. It's not, it's not pretty crying. You know what I mean? I mean, she is, she is absolutely bawling. I mean, you know, like some of the noises she's making at first, when you first watch it, you're like, Oh, that's unpleasant. But I mean, it's so believable. Your whole family just was killed and she sells it so well. I've, I've never been hit with so much emotions in a movie than I was by her in that scene. The grief that she portrays in that scene is fantastic. And later on in the movie, there's an amazing transition. And I probably should have mentioned this in, in the directing round, but I'll go ahead and mention it here because the acting is involved also. But there's a scene where she walks through a door of their apartment and of their apartment, and then the scene cuts to her walking through a door into the bathroom of the airplane that they're on going to Sweden. And it's such an amazing transition. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, the first time I watched it, I was taken aback by how good it was, but she's sobbing in the bathroom and she's trying not to be upset. She's trying to maintain her composure, but you can just tell she's someone who is in a relationship where she can't vent out her feelings to anybody because she knows that he just doesn't care. He's not interested. So when she gets time alone to really kind of harp on those feelings, it just all comes out. I mean, it's some of the most believable grief. It's the most believable grief. That is the most believable showing of grief and sadness in a movie that I've ever seen. It's just absolutely fantastic. And I mentioned her being, you know, British. And it's kind of funny because almost all of the people in this cast are not American. And for the most part, they're playing, you know, American college students and all of that, not just Florence Pugh, but all of their accents are amazing. Uh, very convincing. You know, if I didn't know that Florence Pugh was British and I just watched this movie, I'd assume she was American. And accents are a very hard thing to nail. Uh, I recently watched The New Mutants and the accents in that movie arguably tanked the film. <laughs> it's not a good movie, but it would have been a little bit better if the accents were better and believable. But, you know, I, when you watch as many movies as we have, I don't want to speak for Tyler or Ray, but for me, I'm really good at picking out when an actor who's doing an American accent, their accent slips, you know, they're talking and they're, you know, doing a good job. And then they might say a word or a phrase and they're saying, and that the way they say it sounds like their native tongue. Right. You know what I mean? Like their accent might kind of slip. That happens a lot in movies now that, and you know, before I'd heard somebody else mention that, that's when I started to look for it. If you're not looking for it, you won't notice it, but her accent does never slips at all. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. It's one of the best accents in a movie I've ever seen. For a while, I thought Margot Robbie was the best accent performer in Hollywood. I, honestly, I think Florence Pugh is now because her American accent is just fantastic. And all the cast does a great job. Like I said, Jack Rayner's Irish. Um, he's great. He's very good at portraying this douchebag that you just cannot stand. And, he just does such a great job. It's funny because I've seen him in another movie, uh, Transformers Age of Extinction, which is a, a giant pile of crap. I don't recommend it. He was but, in that? But, but he's in that movie, and Ow. he's he's really bad in the movie. And it's just funny seeing him just a few years later just nail a performance in this one. He definitely took the criticism from that movie and was a lot better. And I think he almost rivals Florence Pugh in a way he's very good. Now his character doesn't have as many emotions to display on screen. You know, the range of emotion he shows are, it's essentially just showing somebody who's just kind of like, yeah, whatever. But he's so believable in doing that. The comedic presence in this movie, Will Poulter, who, you know, is very, you know, you probably don't recognize the name. The average viewer might not recognize the name, but if you've seen we're the Millers, he, but everybody like the recognizes yeah, he plays, the eyebrows. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Very distinct eyebrows on that guy. Um, he's been in a bunch of stuff. He's also British, and he essentially plays an American person in everything he's in, almost, to the point to where before this review, I'm not kidding, I didn't even know that he was British. 
His American accent is perfect. The accent work in this movie is amazing. The emotions displayed through the actors is amazing. Florence Pugh is freaking phenomenal. Like I said, it's my Midsummer is my favorite horror movie, if you want to classify it as that. And her performance in this movie is my favorite uh, acting performance by a female in anything. I think she's absolutely freaking amazing. Um, I also love how, again, she's just so exemplary. That's the big thing. And that's a theme in both of these movies, obviously. Just grief and tragedy. And it, her and Tony Collette both do great jobs at this. I just feel like Florence Pugh, to me, was a little bit more believable. Now, the dinner scene in Hereditary is, you know, obviously one of the highlights of the movie. And Tony Collette is awesome in that scene. I, I feel like at parts, um, Tyler, don't crucify me here, but I feel like it, um, I, I feel like at some points, Tony Collette goes a little too far for me in that scene as far as You're wrong. Overacts, uh, overacts a tad. You're wrong. Yeah, see, I, knew you, I knew you wouldn't agree with that. She overacts a little bit in that. In that nope. scene, it, it, it's brief, but it goes a little too far. Nope. I think everything Florence Pugh does is believable throughout the whole thing. Also, last thing I want to talk about in the acting round, the actor who plays Pele, and I can't remember the guy's name. He's a Swedish actor, and he's only been in short films. He doesn't even have a Wikipedia page. You know, he's not very well known. He's This was like his first major role in a, in a film, in a feature-length film, Vil an American Vil production. Yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, that sounds right. I knew it was something. It, it's like the most Swedish-sounding name you've ever heard of. It is. <laughs> but... But yeah, he's he's great in the movie. When you first meet him, he's very mysterious and really charismatic. The, the, the scene between him and Danny, the first interaction you see between them, you know from the get-go that he's the only one of these guys who shows her any attention. Now you learn throughout the movie that he has an ulterior motive and he's not a good person. But until we get some more details about his character, he's very charismatic and he pulls it off very well. You can already tell that, yeah, you know, he, he'd probably be a better boyfriend for her than Christian would be. Now, obviously, he's very manipulative, and he's just using her to get what he wants. In the same way Christian is, Christian's using her to have a relationship, to have the status of, hey, I got a girlfriend uh, dating for years now, just like Pele is using her for his purpose, right? So it's the same kind of deal. And that actor is amazing in the movie as well. And for an actor who doesn't even have a Wikipedia page, who his first starring role in a feature film is... Very impressive. Ari Aster is a director, and I think we both agree, who brings the most out of his actors. Florence Pugh is an Oscar-nominated actress at this point. I haven't seen Little Women. I just haven't seen it. It's on my watch list. I'm sure she's fantastic in it, but and she got nominated for that, and I'm happy for her. But the fact that she wasn't nominated for this movie is a travesty. I mean, she's honestly on another level, transcendent performance. All the acting in this movie is great, and that's really all I have to say about the acting. All right. Tyler, anything to add? Not at all, other than I'm looking up this Wilhelm guy, and he has like 6,000 followers on Instagram, so he's not he... popular at all. Seriously? Not at all. And I'm saying that he's such a good actor. I'm surprised he I... hasn't been in more. I know. That's Especially what I'm saying. He's great. That. Right. He's on the come up. He is. But um, although I already have my winner... Let's go ahead and hear a closing argument from both of you to oh, that means finish that up this debate. Someone won already. Someone hmm. won four. Okay, so I think. Tyler, you started the acting round, right? Yeah, I did. Okay, yeah. So I'll I'll go real quick. My I'll keep my closing argument brief. I love both of these films. I'll go. I'll, I'll go ahead and say it. I actually love Hereditary. I think it's very well made. Uh, it's a very well-made supernatural horror film. I just, given the themes in Midsummer, the relate the way it explores a toxic relationship, the performances from the actors, the cinematography, and the unique setting of a horror movie for uh, this film, Midsummer, it, it just transcends Hereditary in every way to me. I absolutely love both films, but the edge goes to Midsummer for me. It's like Ari Aster had an mate knock that out of the park. Let's say he hit a home run with Hereditary. He hit a grand slam with Midsummer. It's such a different film genre wise from his debut, but at the same time, they're very similar in their th some of their themes and their structure and the tragedy top deal. He's very good at exploring all that. But Midsummer to me just kind of reined it all in. Everything he does well kind of came to a head in this movie. And I love this film. Like I said, it's in my top 10 movies of all time. Florence Pugh's amazing in it. It's my favorite performance by an actress ever. And I'm very excited to see what Ari Aster does next. I doubt it will top 
midsummer for me, but I'm excited to see it. And yeah, that's my brief closing argument. Yeah, I'll also keep my closing argument brief. I think that Hereditary, as I've said numerous times, is an absolute masterpiece. I think that the writing, directing, and acting in the movie all tie together so well, and I cannot believe it was Ari Aster's directorial debut in terms of like feature-length movies. It feels like someone who has been directing for 50 years and is a master of the craft, and I'm so excited to see what he has to do next. Like The writing, flawless. The pacing, flawless. The directing, and all of the little things that Astro does in this movie to scare you and get under your skin. I have never watched another movie like it. I like, it's, like I said, like I said in the writing on it, this movie made me forget that I exist as a human being. What kind of movie does that other than a, a pure masterpiece? That some of the best acting I have ever ever seen in a movie you know luke can sing midsummer's praises all he wants but anyone that has seen these two films can surely recognize that hereditary is on a completely different level than midsummer is and really that's all i have to say i feel like i have said enough in the other rounds to give myself the best chance of winning ray said he always had a winner so i don't feel like i need to elaborate any further so i'm just going to end it there all right. And I guess this concludes our Midsummer versus Hereditary debate. As I said earlier, I do have a winner. Let's hear it, Ray. But first, we'll break it down in each round. Opening argument, that round goes to Tyler. Yep. Yeah. I, figured, I, figured it's, yeah. I figured that. Yeah. And the writing round also goes to Tyler. Yeah. Okay. And for the first time in Cinebros podcast history, round three, the directing... Goes to Tyler. Golly. So we have a win within the first three rounds wait, for the first hold up, time wait, in wait. history. Have I actually not won a directing round before? No, I'm saying for the first time in history, someone won like in the first three rounds. Like they won the first three in a row. Didn't that yeah. happen in Brightburn? I don't think so. I don't think oh, so. Oh, no, no. I no. think Luke uh, got yeah. one off you there. I think early. Luke won the directing, I think. Or one of them. Yeah. But yeah, Tyler, you honestly gave me, during the debate, you gave me a new viewpoint on Hereditary because when I first watched Hereditary, I wasn't like as blown away with it as like most people had hyped it up to me. But when you were talking about it, you for sure like gave me a couple different outlooks on it. Hey, and Luke, glad. I love that movie. You tried to defend Midsummer. I think Midsummer's a good movie. I was not, there's no bias in any of my decision. I just think that Tyler's arguments did more for me. Hey, and no, but, I'm not biased because you beat me last week too. <laughs> no, no, I mean, bye, yes, I, I will, bye, yes, bye, yes. I, I, I will go ahead and say I definitely think Tyler deserves this win. This was a hard episode for me just because I really like both of these movies. And it's always a struggle to debate against a movie that I'm a big fan of. You know what I mean? So yeah. I, think Tyler, I think Tyler brought his A game on this one. Um, he did. He came out the gates. Yeah, he did, he did really good. You can really. I see was also just winging it so. that entire time. I had nothing prepared. That's that's usually when you do best in debates. That's I know, I that's why I've stopped preparing. <laughs> um, but Luke, I will say you did win the acting round. Okay, so it wasn't a total sweep. That's literally It the wasn't only a thing. total sweep. That's the only thing that's important to Luke is the acting. <laughs> no, that's not true. It's the most important to me, but it's not the only thing. And um, I for, honestly forgot that Will Poulter was in Midsummer, and he's he really is funny in that movie. Like He is, he, yeah. He made me laugh several times when I was watching it. It's because like... They're at this like big cult place and like there's no technology or anything and he just pulls up blowing clouds with a vape. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, all right, Luke. Yeah. Have you ever seen a movie character who more reminds you of Ray than Will Poulter in that movie? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, I don't think so, Tyler. I think that's the one. <laughs> all right. Do you, wait. Who run the who won the closing argument just for debate's sake? Uh, I didn't really pick a winner because it was over, but for Derek's sake, we'll uh, we'll give it to Luke. Okay, there we go. You guys, your guys' closing arguments were kind of similar to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. All right. Yeah. yeah. So with that, we're gonna move into story time. Ray, I think it's your time, but I guess I'll hop into story time. But first, we'll have a word from our sponsor. This is a story of Ray fishing in summer of 2020 during a global pandemic. Also known as the only thing that Ray did in the summer during the global <laughs> pandemic. Yeah, but this day was different. 
So my 2007 Jeep Liberty, which has four wheel drive is broke down and I'm now driving my grandpa's old pickup truck, which doesn't have four wheel drive. And my friends and I had been fishing early in the day and we got ended up getting rained out. We were in Grayson fishing and we came home, got rained out. The rain ended up stopping. So we decided to go to a local pond, just try and catch some bass with the leftover bait we had. So we pull up to this place with, that has like eight ponds. You just have to go through the woods and stuff and find them. And I I park my truck and it's, keep in mind, it's muddy from, from the rain earlier. So I park my truck. It's about eight-ish right now, but it's in the summer. So eight, it's still, you know, pretty much for the most part daylight. So I park my truck and I'm like, hmm, you know, it feels like it's kind of in the mud, but I'm going to go, I'm not going to worry about it right now. I'm just going to go keep fishing. So we keep fishing. We end up catching a lot, you know, and it's up being a pretty good day fishing, even though it rained. But it's nighttime at this point. It's about 930. We're walking back through the dark woods. You know, it's kind of sketchy. But nobody anywhere nearby. We get in the truck and I immediately put it in drive. And what do you know? We're stuck. We're stuck in this mud hole. It's 930 at night. I'm in my grandpa's truck. I'm scared my grandpa's going to kill me because I got it stuck in the mud. He's in bed. He can't come help us. So we call one of my friend's brothers and he get, brings his truck to, you know, try and come help pull us out. So after about 30 minutes, we can't get it out with his truck. So at this point, it's about 11 o'clock at night, 1130. So the guy decides to go with his brother to go get more people to come help us. His friends. And his friends were good old Westwood boys like me, you know, from Fairview. And these guys, we're, we're waiting on them. They, they leave to go get back up. But our backup's at Taco Bell. And I stayed back with the truck with one of my other friends in the middle of the woods while they went to go get back up. So we're waiting out here for at least an hour on these guys while they're at Taco Bell. Shout out Taco Bell for having the slowest drive through in America. Yep. Can confirm. Yep. But we're out here in the dark, here in coyotes, here and all kinds of stuff. One thing I will give Taco Bell: there, are, there is no other restaurant that I pass at like one o'clock in the morning that has a line wrapped around the street. <laughs> I swear, man, they <laughs> get business. That's like when they no flourish. Matter what time I of the feel day. like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, we're out here in the middle of the woods. It's freaking midnight, eleven thirty at this point. We're here in coyotes. We're hearing all kinds of stuff around us. Waiting on these guys. And these guys to pull up. I see the biggest diesel truck I've ever seen. Like a, a civilian drive. <laughs> like they're, you know, you know, the Calvary's here. Two dudes hop out, big guts, big, huge beards. They, every one of them's got pistols on their hips. These guys, they hook up to my truck, bada bing, bada boom. I'm out of there in a snap of a finger. All it took was a good old, couple of good old boys from Westwood to come get me out. Just a good old boy. And uh, we drove home. I woke up the next morning. The truck was washed. My grandpa had washed it. And uh, I asked my grandma what he had said. And all he said was, Raymond got the truck stuck in the mud last night. <laughs> <laughs> and I hadn't even said anything about it yet. And he I mean, I think it was kind of obvious unless like, yeah, mud yeah. just appeared. Yeah, like, it, was, it, it rained it mud. Was, it it looked like the truck was a new color. Let's just say. <laughs> you know, I've always wondered how, like, you know, you pass somewhere on the road and their car is literally covered from top to bottom in mud. I've always wondered how that happens, but I, I think you've just told us how. Well, I people actually do it on purpose. People yeah. do it for fun. They go mudding. I, go however, mudding, was yeah. not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you just I got was, stuck. I was just trying to fish, yeah. Oh, well, we're going to bring this episode to a close. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed. If you enjoy the show, you can follow us on any of our social medias at Cinebros Podcast on Facebook and Instagram, Cinebros P on Twitter. If you're not watching on YouTube, we have a YouTube channel called Cinebros. Just look out for a yellow reel icon. And if you're on Reddit, we have our own subreddit at r slash Cinebros Podcast. Guys, anything else to add? Nope. Not, not really. Be on the lookout for more five minute movie reviews on Monday. All right. And we'll see you later. Bye.